running Facebook World. It's going to be starting in just a few Good morning, church. Glory, glory, glory. Our God is good. Amen. You know what? Did you bring your A game today? Did you bring your A men? Do you agree that our God is good? Yeah, that he hasn't already. 
again.
that's not somebody touched me on my shoulder and it wasn't anybody human because I came out of the room and came free in my shoulder blade, which I've been putting up with for the last two or three years. And um, yeah, it was so tangible. It's in my shoulder or whoever was sitting behind me had done it, but it was nobody. God touched me. I haven't had a pain. I'm still pain free. There's no, uh, there's, there's no better way to uh, to demonstrate one's face than by kissing. Yeah. Yeah. I feel anyway. Yeah. They will know us by our testimony. Yes, your story. Yeah. We're going to pray for God. Thank you for Janice Hart's this congregation, Lord. Um, I don't, uh, all this money is put to good use for God, the offering of it. Um, I pray all that in Jesus' name. This song is just one of the most beautiful songs I've ever read, ever heard and read. The lyrics in this song. You step down into darkness. The light of the world. Join me in this song.
holy as I am holy, says the Lord. sometimes but I went shopping yesterday and I went to my usual <coughs> supermarket people say why do you go there you could save money I go there because of the kindness of strangers and um, someone who I didn't know who would reach up and get something down from the high shelf for me and do so gladly <coughs> um, going out to the car and putting my shopping in the car and a lady who I didn't know walking up and saying, I'll put that trolley away for you. Um, the kindness of strangers. There is someone who was a stranger to each and every one of us who was so kind. I was um, pondering about the things of God and just sort of hanging out with the Lord as I do. And a question came to my mind. And um, that's all I've got this morning, is the question. But I wanted to wait until the elements are 
hand it out because sometimes we multitask when perhaps we shouldn't and um, we can be distracted and think about other things. But Jesus Christ was a stranger to each and every one of us. He was someone we did not know. He was someone we did not care about. And um, yeah, he had this amazing plan. The Father had this plan because he loves us. All those last ones being handed out, we're going to pray. Dearest Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that while we were still sinners, Lord Jesus, you died for us. <coughs> Lord, I ask you this morning that my words not be mine but yours. Holy Spirit, that you would speak and say what you want to say to this congregation this morning so that we might continue in our walk with you the way you want us to. In Jesus' name, amen. I do want to say thank you to the people who do this week after week and um, I just think it's wonderful that there are people who serve in various capacities in our congregation, people who clean, people who wash dishes, people who hand out communion, people who check and make sure there's toilet rolls and uh, a lot of us don't even notice, we just um, have our service and we don't notice that these wonderful people are doing that, mowing grass and all sorts of things. Thank you. This is the question. Do I think I was worth Jesus dying for? I want you to sit there and think, and I want you to ask yourself this question. Do I think I was worth Jesus dying for? I had to answer no. No. I had nothing to recommend me, nothing that was worth the very Son of God going through that torture, that pain, that agony. The Bible says that that battle that he fought in his soul in that garden was so great that he was sweating drops of blood. I was not worth that. I wasn't worth that. And um, that was me being totally honest with myself before God. So why would he do that? Why would he do that? For us who are unworthy, who have done nothing to earn so great a sacrifice as this. The answer is found in one word, love. God loved me so much that he sent his only son that if I would believe in him, I would not perish but have everlasting life. It doesn't hurt us sometimes to make the word of God personal and to understand that yes, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. But I'm part of that world. And he's a personal God. And as you sit here this morning and you've heard these words, I pray that you would think that, yes, God loves me so much that he gave his only son that if I believe on him, I will not perish will have everlasting life. And um, as I began to think about that, I began to think about when did Jesus die for me? He didn't die for me when I was all spruced up and holy and ready to say, okay, Lord, I've got something to give you now. He died for me while I was still a sinner. The Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While I was still a sinner, Lord Jesus, you died for me. You died for me. And um, he loves us. 
how we are. We don't have to get our hair coloured. <laughs> I like the colour lines. We don't have to grow taller. We don't have to dress a certain <coughs> way. We don't have to present ourselves. We don't have to say, okay, I'm now going to think right. Now God will accept me. None of that. He loves us how we are. He loves us how we are. He loves you how you are. Amen. And I began thinking about a few other things. And I thought, you know, there are some things about myself I don't like. It might be physical things. It might be other things that we don't like about ourselves. Who do we think we are? To stand there and say that there is something about this person God loves that is not likeable. That is not lovable. And so then I... <laughs> going to get through this. I stood in front of the mirror, full length mirror, and I looked at myself. And I said, God loves you. I looked myself in the eye. And I said, God loves you. And something broke in me that had, um, I was not even aware of. Um, we are so hard on ourselves, so critical of ourselves. And yet a stranger will come up and say, I'll put that trolley away for you. When I couldn't even see that, to be honest, I couldn't do it. Um, don't be so hard. On yourself. God loves you and you and you and you and you and that's why Jesus died. We could not do it ourselves and if we think that there was something in us that made us worthy we are <coughs> wrong. Our DNA was all wrong. Our father Adam chose. He made a decision to eat that fruit <laughs> as did Eve, and we are all his descendants, so the DNA was wrong. But Jesus, he came, and he hung on that cross. He was tortured, he was in agony, and if you think <coughs> his depiction was in some way a good way to go, it was not. Very, very painful, often suffocation happening and so they pushed themselves up on those feet where those nails were hanging off, um, holding them to that wood. And then if people thought that they weren't dying fast enough, they'd break their legs so they couldn't do that. There is nothing pleasant about crucifixion. Jesus went through that for me. He went through that for you. Because he loves you. And when we look at that little piece of bread this morning, it is broken, it's a bit rough around the edges. Might I suggest that Jesus was too when he hung on that cross? Because we all were. And he took on him my sin. He took on him <coughs> my sin. No one else could do that. No one else could do that, only God himself. And Jesus is God. He still is God. When we see that juice, and um, perhaps we don't understand the shedding of Jesus' blood, not only on that cross, but before in the garden, where he was in such agony of soul for us, where our sin was placed on him, and he willingly carried it. At any time, he could have called uncle and gone, you know, could have said, no, I can't do this. But he went through it. He was obedient. For us, love, love, great love, love for us. So this morning, as we eat this bread and as we drink this juice, I want us to think about his love. Lord Jesus, your love for me. And might I suggest it's a very good <coughs> exercise to stand in front of that mirror look yourself in the eye and say, God loves you. Because you know what he does? He loves us. He loves you.
it loves me. And that's it really. The whole of this crucifixion was because God loves us. And if we would believe on him, we will not perish but have eternal life. And it didn't end there. Um, I must admit, if I hadn't been there in the day, I'd been hanging out where Mary Magdalene was at the last place I'd seen him. She was at the tomb. She was hanging out there because that's the last place she'd seen her saviour. And I'd been there because I was one of the worst too. And um, she saw Jesus risen from the dead. She got to go and tell how she'd seen Jesus. Jesus is risen. Jesus is alive. Imagine yourself outside that tomb. The stone is rolled away. The body's not there. There's someone there in shining white clothes. Why are you looking for the dead, for the living among the dead? And she sees Jesus and she says, she thinks he's the gardener, and she says, What have you done with my Lord's body? And Jesus says the one word to her that meant everything. Mary. This morning as you stand there, do you hear Jesus saying to you, Your name? Your name? Because your name is precious to him. And he knows your name. Other people might forget. They might say, well, yeah, I know I was introduced to you last week, but I just can't remember your name. Jesus knows you by name. And he loves you. This morning, I just want us to think about these things. I want us to think about where am I? Where am I in all of this? (coughs) Have I ever accepted what Jesus did for me? Have I ever seen it before, seen his great love for me and realise that I can do nothing to deserve what Jesus did? All I can do is say, thank you, Jesus, to ask him to forgive me for all the bad in my life and to wash me clean, come into my life, wash all the bad out. And Lord, Jesus, thank you for setting me free from all that bad stuff. Now I would like to walk with you. Maybe we did that many, many years ago. And maybe over the intervening years, we've grown a little jaded in our thinking and our thoughts. Maybe people who call themselves Christians have done bad things to us or said bad things. Don't take out on God, the evil people do. Don't think because they said they know you or that they were doing something in in his name that they were. Jesus loves you as you are. Maybe you need this morning to come to him and say, Jesus, I know you love me. I know you know me. Please forgive me for being so distant to you, not understanding your love for me. (coughs) Maybe we're right in there. We've been um, walking with him and we're pressing in. We're waiting for this move of the Holy Spirit. Lord, whatever you want me to do, say be, that I will do, say be. This morning, just come anew and say, Lord Jesus, thank you. It began with your love. It began with you accepting me how I was. And now I don't recognise who I am as to what I was then. Change is so great. Be grateful and be grateful to him. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. Your love, so great, so vast that I don't think the world could contain it should it be written down how great your love is. Thank you for loving (coughs) us personally. Thank you, Jesus, for this great sacrifice that you made. Thank you that you are the risen King of kings and Lord of lords, and one day you're coming back for me. You're coming back for us. How great is your love, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Let's eat and drink together. As we do, thank him in your own words. 
don't have to have fancy prayers. You don't have to have fancy words. Thank him from your heart this morning. Your heart to the heart of Jesus.
state of revival, a constant state of growth and development. And I believe that that's a word for our church, that this word, and, and I keep harking back to a message Steve had, I think, before you even moved here, a prophecy over this church. It wasn't just a word. It was a word for this church. It was a prophecy over this church. There would be a church that was um, healthy and growing and full of love. And, you know, I believe that's a word that's been spoken over this place, and I believe that is our church. That's yes. who we are. Yes. And I love that. And I want to actually get a big sign painted up here with that on it. Because I just think, you know, that's who we are. That's the church God's called us to be. A healthy church. A place where good things happen. A place where people find themselves in God. And where their lives are changed and transformed. Where they grow into maturity in God. Where they leave behind the old life and get on the new life and develop their life as a new creation. A healthy church, a growing church. The book of Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about us growing up into maturity together. And that's what we want to do. All right? We want to be a church full of love. A place where people can come and feel loved. Feel accepted. Where they can come to know God. And I think, you know, together that's the great commandment to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and to love your neighbour as you love yourself. So loving is the all-encompassing, isn't it? To love God, to love ourselves. And Val was talking about that today, not in a selfish way, loving ourselves, but loving ourselves because God loves us. And I can look at myself and say, I love you. Because God loves you. God loves me. So I can love me because God loves me. So that's who we are as a church. But I love this pattern of Operation Outreach. And I love that, um, that Leo Harris had this vision. Now, it's actually 75 years since the CRC came into being this year. It's the 75th birthday of the CRC. But here we are, we're all set, we're all ready, and we're ready to go. And this Operation Outreach has got like a pattern to follow. And what his ideas were, that we had have a deep desire. We need to have a deep desire to, to follow God. We need to have a deep desire to get to know God. We have a deep desire together as a fellowship not just to fluff along in everyday life, but a deep desire to actually have the Holy Spirit flowing through our church. Mm. A deep desire to grab mm. hold of the things of God, the Word of God, and to, and to enact it in our lives. Mm. And to follow God with everything we have. So with that deep desire, we need to have a definite program. And I'll talk more about this in the future. But, you know, we, we have programs... But we need to have a definite vision and a, and a plan and know where we're going as a church and, and be able to um, have step-by-step -step strategies on how to get there and how to go about those programs and what to do. We had a marvellous program over summer that we're just rejoicing about. The, the summer in the parks, we took out the Love Gippsland van and had coffee and sausages. Hands up those who never want to see a sausage again. <laughs> Not for a little while. But you know what? We shared what we have with the community. We shared some bread and sausages. We shared a cup of coffee. Kids came, strangers, you know, came and played footy. In the rain. In the rain. Yesterday. We got out yesterday because we said we are going to be there in that park. But we got there and we went there and it poured rain. But you know what? We had a beautiful afternoon and it was just lovely fellowship and something that's come out of that plan and that program is, you know, we might not have seen dozens and dozens of people come to the Lord and get saved out of it or whatever, but we've made, we've planted a flag in the community. We've, we've you know, maybe it looked like a big red band. <laughs> but you know what? It's us saying, you know what? Community of Maui. We're here, we love you, yes. and we want, we're bringing the kingdom of God to this place. Yes. 
You know, we've, we've arrived in your park and we've arrived here in your neighbourhood and we're planting a flag in your neighbourhood and we're saying your kingdom come here in this neighbourhood. We're saying God loves you in this neighbourhood. You know, we had a definite program there over the summer that we were just going to reach out to our neighbourhood and we were going to love people in the name of Jesus. So every cup of coffee, every sausage that was made, it was saying we love you and Jesus loves you. And we're here to let you know that. So we need to have that definite program. We need to have dedicated unity. And that's another thing about this outreach that we've just had. There was a unity. There was a definite unity, unified heart and mind of the team of people who came together for that outreach. They had all had this goal in mind. They were all unified in, in what they wanted to do and get out there and reach out to the neighbourhood and bring the love of God out there. There was a unity that joined people together in one heart and one mind and one vision. And disciplined minds. <coughs> we need to have minds, the Bible says, our minds need to be transformed by the washing of the water of the word. All of these things need to be completely founded on the word of God. Yes. And we can have dreams and visions, and I'll get into that in a minute. We can have dreams and visions, but all of our dreams and visions we need to have our feet planted, planted firmly in the Word of God and know it and understand it and have our minds disciplined. We don't like that word very much sometimes, do we, being disciplined? But we do. And, uh, and have deliverance ministry. We want to see people saved, set free and transformed by the power of the blood of Jesus, by the Holy Spirit in their life. We want to see people's lives transformed. And that's what that deliverance ministry is about. It's not perhaps some of the things that might be conjured up in your mind if you're old school Pentecostal. We're not talking about that. Though some of that takes place, that people are delivered from demonic forces. And you know, we've got, I just want to, can I talk about you for a minute, Jack? Yeah. yeah. Talking about deliverance ministry. You know, God's so good, isn't he? Yeah. You know, last Saturday, Sunday night over at Lee, was it last Sunday night or the week before? Yeah, two, weeks. two weeks ago over at Lee and Gaffer were just worshipping God, just worshipping God. Nobody's preaching or anything, just worshipping God. And Jack has this amazing encounter with the Holy Spirit. Isn't it good, Jack? It's amazing. He's going to share his testimony one day soon. Wow. And you know what? Jack... After that, that was the uh, that opened the door for him, for him to give his heart to the Lord. Come on. Didn't that? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, Lord, Lord. Just for sitting in the worship service. You know what? God's into delivering people and setting people free yeah. and setting us on a new course yeah. in life with Him. And that's a good thing. And that's our founder, Leo Harris, who's passed away, passed around the seventies, but he left behind a message. And we're part of that history now. We're part of that story. Okay, <coughs> so we're going to talk today about having a deep desire. What is a deep desire and what are we desiring? And I know what I think, you know, I've been praying a lot about this. My desire and asking the Lord for a vision. And I've been watching online and, and uh, listening to the other preachers around the town and listening to their... Um, vision statements for the year and I'm thinking, Lord, I feel a bit behind the eight ball here. I don't know if I've got a real vision statement for the year. <coughs> but you know what? The, the Lord is... I, I know, and this is what he told me, that as we talk about this today, as we get a handle on what he's talking to us now, we collectively as a church, we are going to get the vision. Because yeah, you know what? It's going to get caught, yeah. not taught. And I'm not just going to say, well, you know what, this is our vision, and here we go, and you guys are coming after me. You know what, the Holy Spirit is saying, he's going to speak to this congregation, and together, collectively, we are going to have the vision, and that's how we're going to have the dedicated unity to go and do what the Holy Spirit's yeah. calling us as a church to do. So, amen, I believe that. So, together, we are doing this thing, and, and we're going to be asking the Lord, what's your deep desire, Lord? What's your desire for us, for this church, for me as an individual? Because I want to link my heart with you. I want my heart to be linked together with the heart of God and go on this journey together. 
oh, look, I just love God. And at the moment, I am just in a place that I can hardly describe. You know what? Desire drives our life. Things that we desire drives us, doesn't it? We're driven by desire. And so as we desire things, it's not always good, is it? The Bible talks about that, you know, sometimes our heart desires things that we shouldn't have. And they're fleshly desires and worldly desires and, and um, they're desires that will actually lead us the wrong way. Desires of the flesh, right? Sometimes we look at things we shouldn't be looking at, all right? Sometimes we think about things we shouldn't be thinking about. And we start walking down the wrong path. Go up that next slide, please. And so that's why the Holy Spirit says to us, so it says if we walk in the Spirit, we will not gratify, gratify the lust of the flesh. Because our flesh speaks very loudly. And it's saying, you know, feed me. <laughs> Go me. I'm cold. I'm hot. You know, it tells us things. It tells us to do things. That we don't want to do in God and to live lifestyles that sometimes take us away from God. And we don't want to walk that walk <coughs> and talk that talk. We want to live by the Spirit. And so the answer to these lustful thoughts or, or self-gratifying <coughs> thoughts and uh, those desires that would perhaps lead us down the wrong path, the answer to that isn't to look, to look at those things and say, well, I've got to try and stop doing that. So we've talked recently about putting off the old and putting on the new, but I can tell you with all assurance today that the answer to that is to keep our eyes on Jesus. Yes. He's the author and finisher yes. of our faith. We're going to keep our eyes on Jesus, and it says to walk in the Spirit, and you're not going to gratify the lust of the flesh. So what we need is not to be, you know, just um, continually focusing on the things we don't want to do, but we need to be living in the spirit, focusing on Jesus, walking with him, listening to him, being filled with the spirit. And it says if we do that, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. <coughs> Look, we all struggle from time to time with things. All right? It's a, a world out there full of I want this now. You know? I want that, you know, what does it say? You know, does somebody say KFC? You know? <laughs> We want to have everything and we want to have it now. But we let things into our lives that we shouldn't be letting into our lives, through our eye gates, through our ear gates, through the things we say. You know, God, first of all, calls us to desire the things that he does, not to desire the things of the flesh or the things of the world. So if we walk in the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, Listen to the Holy Spirit. Grow the fruit of the Spirit. Allow it to grow in our life. We're not going to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. They'll always be out there having a little tent. But we keep our eyes on Jesus and we keep walking in the Spirit. So that's one thing. Our desires, we have to guard our hearts. Don't we? The Bible talks about guarding our hearts. For out of our heart flows all that, all the motivation for our life, it says. So we need to guard our hearts and guard what goes into our hearts. So Proverbs 4, 23 says, Guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. So we need to guard our hearts and guard what goes into it. Alright? So, and the fence, the guard or the keep of our hearts you know, we need to build around our hearts a protective fence, and we do that by filling our hearts and filling our minds and filling our lives with the Word of God. So that's what we want to do. And then we, our desires, we, we start to, our lives are filled <coughs> with the desire from Jesus and the desire for Jesus. And so that's where our desire is. Okay, next slide. So we want to delight in the Lord. So we're not, we're not letting ourselves go after the fleshly ways. We're not letting ourselves go after the worldly ways. We're going to walk 
in the spirit. We're going to keep in step with the Holy Spirit and entrust our lives to him and follow his leading and follow his teaching because that's a good walk to go on. And we're going to not delight ourselves in titillating little things off the internet or whatever. We're going to delight ourselves in the Lord mm. and he will give us the desires of our heart. Yes. And so if we allow him to work in our hearts, he will put the dreams and the desires in our hearts, the things that he wants us to go after, the things he wants us to go for. And we link our heart with his heart and he brings those desires and those dreams into fruition. What's on the next slide? So I need my slides. <coughs> so we need a prophetic vision. How do we do this? Some of these verses, like this one here, in Proverbs 29, <coughs> it says, Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. And the same verse within the old King James Version, it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law is happy. And what the Lord told me about this verse, it's not about just, um, you know, some people say, oh, you need to have these great big, and the Lord is saying, we need great, big, audacious dreams and visions. And we can reach for the stars, and we can reach out, and we can believe the huge things, but we've got to keep our feet firmly planted in the Word of God. And so we need that, because if we don't, our dreams and visions, instead of becoming godly dreams and visions, can become quite fleshly dreams and visions, okay? And we can start going off on our own way and building our own little palaces and things, all right? So if we want our godly vision and we want to have a godly desire, we need to keep our eyes on the Lord and where he's taking us and what he's doing in our lives. But we need to keep, the least is he who keeps the law. And that's not saying we've got to keep the Ten Commandments, one by one by one. We just talked about that this morning. But we need to keep our feet firmly planted in the Word of God. And God was saying to me, you know, you want those big dreams, you want those big, bad, audacious dreams, you go for it. But filter everything through the Word of God, and through the voice of the Holy Spirit and what He is saying to us. And, uh, and I love that about the Lord. He's alive and He's working in us and He gives us living dreams and desires. And He's got dreams and desires and plans. He wants to plan in your heart and in your life. He gives you a hope and a future. That's what He's got for you. He's got big plans for you and He wants you to get hold of it. But He's just saying, have those big audacious dreams that keep your feet firmly planted in the Word of God. So, who's, what, and Mark 11, 24 says, Whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. There's somewhere else it says, you have not because you ask not. You know, we need to be uh, game to ask God for big things. And I've been asking God, what do you want me to believe for? What do you want me to have, you know? And um, I believe God's giving us some big things. You know what, but how's that going to happen? And he said, can you believe for one person to get saved every week? I said, you know, yeah, I think I can. Oh, even that, I mean, last year, I think for the whole year, there are only about seven or eight people come from the Lord. But you know what? Already this year, we've seen probably three or four people come to the Lord, get saved. So that's an average. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, we're in for, what, week five or week six of the year. You know, God's good. And he's keeping his word. And he's saying, no, believe for it. Ask for it. Pray for it. Whatsoever you believe when you pray, believe you've received it and you can have it. So I'm going to link my heart with God and say, okay, God, what do you want us to believe for? Where do you want us to go? What do you want me to reach out for? Okay, I'm going to link my heart to your heart and believe for that. And go with you where you're going and believe for what you want me to believe for. Whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe you've received it and you shall have it. You know, dreams and visions are just vapour unless we put legs on them. Yeah. So God says he'll give us the desires of our heart. 
So what are we dreaming of? What are we desiring? What's on your heart? Are the dreams in your heart aligned with the dreams God's giving you? He's giving you dreams. I could say, let's just be quiet for a second. Let's just, we, we had a little piece of paper. I gave you a little sheet, a little card a couple of weeks ago. I said, ask the Lord to speak to you and give you a vision for the year. Have you written that down? Have you done that? Have you sat with the Lord and said, Lord, give me a vision. Give me a word for the year. Write it down. I did. My word for the year was fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. I said, that sounds really good, Lord. How's that going to work out? He said, I'll show you. <laughs> fruitfulness. That's my word. You get your own word. You might have a word, but I believe it's a word too for this church. That we're going to see a fruitful year. What are we dreaming of? We used to sing that old song, lift your vision high. You know, it's a bit old, a bit old fashioned and it's actually probably a little bit not quite what the word says of that song. But I believe that is something the Lord says we've got to lift our vision high. Our vision, our heart, our desire needs to be aligned with what God is saying to us. Vision is the lens through which we see our deepest desires come to fruition. We can have a deep desire. We can have that thing in our heart. All right, but we need to see it. We need to see it. And we need to ask the Holy Spirit, how are we going to get there? What's the path? What's the next step? Where are we going with this? And it needs to come prophetically. I believe that. I believe that. Psalm 34, verse 7, verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. And this is, I believe, I'm probably getting a little bit off track because I keep coming back to this, that we really need to delight ourselves in the Lord. We can have all the big dreams. You know, we might, we, we might want to build a great big church. We might want to see 300 people get saved. We might want to see one person come in every week. But we need to, our first desire needs to be the Lord. My first desire needs to be the Lord. And, and that's where I just think sometimes I just get stuck there. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. I want to delight in you, Lord. I want to delight in you, in who you are. And, and I know the Lord delights in me because he says he does. He works in us, adjusting and healing and turning us around, preparing us for what he has. And he wants us to see what he sees. So I'm going to delight in you, Lord. I'm just going to love you. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to put all of my dreams and all of my visions at your feet. But I'm going to, my heart is just going to delight in you. And I think that's just something the Holy Spirit is saying right now. So it's a little bit off track of what I'm saying, but I believe that's what the Holy Spirit is saying. So to follow our dreams and our visions. I read this um, from the Jesus Culture um, a course I did a couple of years ago. To really see our vision come to fruition, we need foresight, insight, and oversight, but it all has to come from his sight. And I really like that. That's why I wrote it down. Foresight's like looking at life through a telescopic or a telescope. And, and I picked this up because that's what the Lord's been saying to us about the telescope and the binoculars and the microscope. And this said just what I had been hearing the Lord saying. So I thought it uh, for repeating. So foresight is like looking at life through a telescope at what's ahead and connects us to our future. And I couldn't help thinking about Abraham and through the telescopic lens and God saying, look up and count the stars. You know what? If you can believe for it, I can do it. But you know what? He can do far above everything that we can even think of or imagine. So he wants us to reach out those big audacious dreams. He wants us to look up at the heavens and count the stars and see what God has for us. So he wants us to do that. He wants us to have that foresight. Where are we going to be in five years or ten years' time? 
Where's my family going to be? Where's my life going to be? Lord, what job should I take? How should I get there? What university course should I take? Where should I live? Who should I marry? Big life questions. All right? But God wants us to ask those big questions. And um, I just kept getting, when I was praying about that, I kept getting the word bad, B-A-D, big audacious dreams. You know, we're allowed to have big audacious dreams. And he gave those big audacious dreams to Abraham. And he said, you're going to have a family. And this man was like in his 80s and then he got that vision and that dream. And he hadn't even had kids yet. And how it was, he became a father in his late, late life. And God, through him, began that big audacious dream of making the, the uh, tribe of Israel, the children of Israel. And through that tribe of Israel came Jesus the Saviour. So a big audacious dream. We also need insight. And insight's like looking through a microscope. It gives us understanding of why things happen in life and determines the underlying motivations of the heart. And remember, we, I talked a minute ago about guarding the heart because out of it comes all the motivations of life. And we need to um, keep our heart like a, like a gate, letting the good things in and allowing the word of God to continually wash over us and renew us and cleanse us and wash out the, the stuff that's not supposed to be there. So we need... To say, okay, we've got this big dream, but then we need to look at it under the microscope and say, okay, where's my heart in all this? What, what are my motivations? Is this just something, you know, that I think is a good idea or promoting myself or whatever, you know? Or is this God? Is this God in me? Oversight puts life into context, like a bird's eye view, like the binoculars I've been talking about. Like a helicopter zoning in on the fires. And I've written that down and I meant to grab this photo. Uh, Val sent me a photo yesterday of John um, going out in his little truck and filling up the helicopters. But it was a helicopter, I think that he might have been practicing um, dropping the water on target. And I thought, you know, that's exactly right. We need to be on target. We need to look at things from a bird's eye view and say, okay, God, where are you in this? Let me see things with your eyes. All right, and when it says oversight too, I believe that's why we need each other in the body of Christ. Mm. We need to talk with one another, counsel with one another, come to the oversight of the church, your home fellowship leader or, or you know, one of us, the pastors or whoever here or someone that you um, look up to in the Lord and talk over things with them and get their point of view on your dreams and on your visions and where you're going in the Lord. And then his sight. A vision from the Lord creates a mission from heaven. And I was thinking that Moses received the pattern for the tabernacle from heaven. And God gave him a picture of what it was going to look like. And he said, now you go and write that down. And it's the same Habakkuk. In Habakkuk it says, take the vision and write it down and make it plain. God's going to give us a pattern to follow and things to do and a, and a strategy to follow. And he's saying... Don't take it lightly. Don't forget what I'm telling you. Take it and write it down. Make it plain. And he's going to give us a pattern to follow. And the other pattern he's given us to follow, of course, is Jesus. And Jesus is our main pattern we want to follow. And then we have, in the New Testament, we have in the book of Acts, we have the pattern of the New Testament church to follow. So we want to um, hone things and make them good and make them right and follow that pattern to see our dreams and visions come to life. Our values create the springboard from which our dreams and plans grow. And so all of these things, this is, and I guess this is drilling down to where it's, where we're going with this, is what are our values? Who are we as a church? You know, we've got to ask ourselves first, well, what are my personal values? And that's an exercise I've done over this last couple of weeks. It's right down on the page, my values. You know, I love, the, I love the Lord, top of the list. I love my family, I love church, you know, honesty, integrity. These are, values. These are values. Love and significance. You know, what are some of the values in our church? That everybody that comes into this church will be loved, that they are significant, they mean something. You know, that's a value here. We were talking about it right at the start. We want to be a healthy church. We want to be a healthy, lively church. 
a growing church, a loving church. You know, these are values. So our dreams and vision for this church need to come out of our values, how we see ourselves and who we are. We value family, we value fellowship, all those things we value. So what are our collective dreams and desires? Let's go on to the next. All right, focusing on Jesus, and that's the first thing I think. Jesus is top of the board. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one that started this thing, and he's the one that's going to finish it, and he's the one that's going to be with us right through from beginning to end. Yes. So it's about loving God with all our heart, which is the great commandment. Yes. Yes. The other value we have is winning souls. We believe in, in the gospel. We believe that yes. people need to come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. We believe in making disciples. And so that's the, the great commandment, isn't it? The great commission. We believe in healing and restoration. Yes. Yes. And Steve, I, w- I was talking about that last week. I did tune in and listen to the message last week. And I believe it was spot on on point with what God is saying to us as a church. You know, and he wants to, first of all, bring back to us a passion and a desire to see healing, to see restoration, to see people's lives transformed. It's okay to sit here and enjoy our Sunday worship and enjoy our services and enjoy our meetings. And we do. And we enjoy. And we enjoy all those things. But the other uh, mandate God has given us is to go into all the world. And that's one of the reasons why we have the Love Gives Land Band. One of the reasons why we did the Summer in the Parks program. We're not meant to just sit here and be comfortable and happy. We're meant to go and make disciples. And we're meant to see people's lives healed and transformed and restored because that's who Jesus is and that's what he did and he told us to do that he said what are you going to do you've got to go heal the sick raise the dead cleanse the lepers chuck out the demons you know and proclaim the kingdom of God so that's what we want to do proclaim the kingdom of God here in our neighborhood we want a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Who needs a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit? But God, I do. You know, we need that fresh breeze. We need that fresh wind. We need to be woken up and stirred up and made alive by the Holy Spirit. These are some of our desires. We want to be a lively, loving, loving, growing church community. Is that how you see us? Do you see us as that? Let's keep that vision in front of our eyes. Let's not criticise one another or bring one another down or be complaining about things or, or, oh, I can't be bothered getting to church today or, oh, look, I know so-and-so could probably do the visit, but you know what, I'll flick them a text instead. Guilty. You know, we need to not lapse into that state Mm. of being lethargic Mm. and stop growing. We want to be a lively, healthy, growing church. So do we see ourselves that way? Do we see who we are? Let's keep seeing who we are in Christ. Have we got one more? That's the end of the slide, Josh. But you know what? I just want us to pray. I want us to think, you know, first of all, Lord, where do I fit into this picture? Mm. You know, where do I fit into this? I'm part of this healthy, (coughs) lively, growing church. Show me where I fit into this. Give me dreams and visions of how I fit here, what my role is, and how I can participate in it. Have you actually sat and asked the Lord for a big audacious dream lately? Lord, I pray today you give people big audacious dreams. The Lord says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you. I think there's someone that's needed to hear that. God's got your life in his hands and he knows your future. And he's saying, just trust me. Trust me in all your heart. And I'm going to help you take that leap of faith into your future. Big audacious dream. Lord, there's some of us whose desires have been sullied. They've been 
adulterated by the things of the world. And we've got caught up with plans, we've got caught up with dreams, we've got caught up with desires that aren't of you. So Lord, today we just want to leave those things here at the altar and we want to, our desire to be of you. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside you. Yes. My heart, that'll fail me. All the things I try to do can fail without you, Lord, but you are the strength of my heart. Lord, strengthen my heart again. Build that guard around my heart so that my desire is for you. Like the psalmist says, I want my heart to follow hard after you, diligently after you, so that my dreams and desires are born in you and then nurtured and empowered and fed by the Holy Spirit. <coughs> so I'm just going to play this hymn. Phil's just going to put it up. It's an old hymn. It's Be Thou My Vision. O oh Lord of my heart, there's nothing else I want if it doesn't come from you. You're welcome to sing along or otherwise. Let's just bow our heads before the Lord today and declare once again, Lord, you are king of my heart. You are the love of my heart. So that all the other dreams and visions, those big audacious dreams, come from your heart, Lord Jesus. You're welcome to come out the front if you would like to. And just come and rededicate your heart to the Lord, rededicate your life to the Lord. Come and seek a fresh blessing, a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit on you. You've never given your life to the Lord. Now's the day. You want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come and receive it. It's here to be had. It's here to be given. There's a whole big space in it.